Christmas! Son! Mom! Ah! Oh. Welcome to Connections Church Online. We're so glad you could join us. Just have a couple things that I want to let you know about before we get into things. First of all, Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m., we have Kids Church Online with Pastor Kyle and his co-host, Commander Spaceman. And then also on Fridays at uh, 7 p.m., we have Youth with yours truly. I don't have a a cool co-host named Commander Spaceman, but sometimes I bring uh, interesting characters and impressions into the mix. So, if that doesn't entice your youth, I don't know what will. Anyway, with that, I'm going to hand things over to our worship team. Lord, we just pray for your hope, Lord, to, to be real for us, Lord, to know that it's not just some sort of optimistic feelings, Lord, it's the trust in you who is faithful, even when we're not. We just thank you for that, Lord. I hope in this season, you who came down to us in the most vulnerable form to show us what it is to be human, to what it is to be a follower, to die for our sins, and to live and be resurrected in power. We thank you for that, Lord. we 
Good morning, everyone. I can take this off. How's everybody doing this morning? It's a nice wintry morning. Thank you, worship team. That was nice to uh, just, I don't know, sing. Uh, Paul said in um, Ephesians, one of the signs of the Spirit was singing together. So it's so nice to sing together on uh, when, when we get a chance to. And that's wonderful this morning. And I know that uh, in my personal faith journey, uh, we've talked a lot about the early church, uh, the church in the first century, first century Christians. And I know uh, we actually talked at one point about emulating the church in the first century. And I don't I've come to realize that maybe that's not what we should be doing, is emulating the, the, the actual church, the, the way they operated in the first century. But there are certain things that they have or did, which are kind of, I would say, the essence of what Jesus intended the church to be that we should do. And so we're trying to find that, what that means and how it works. And part of that is learning about Jesus learning what Jesus taught, understanding uh, the Bible is one complete story that leads to Jesus. The Old Testament was all about the coming of Jesus. The Gospels are the actual Jesus come to earth, and that's what we're celebrating this season is Jesus' birth. And then the rest of the New Testament is about the early church and how they um, learned about Jesus and how they applied it and how the church became, well, what we became today. So one of the ways that we can mature in our faith um, is by following Jesus and doing things his way instead of our own way, which means that we need to take the teachings of Jesus seriously. And that's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about this, uh, Jesus' most famous teaching. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And we're, uh, you all should have had your copy of the book uh, uh, by Sky Jatani, What If Jesus Was Serious? And so we are trying to understand that. And what I'd like to do right now is we're uh, uh, actually into the next part of the Sermon on the Mount. I'd like to read it together from Matthew 5, 21 to 37. So if you'd like to pull that up on your phone or in your Bible, I'm just going to read it. This is from the New, New Living Translation. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, even if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in the danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Again, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair black or white. Just a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. 
Okay, we're talking about chapter 19 today, if you've been reading ahead. And this is uh, the chapter that says, if Jesus was serious, then we will recognize every person as valuable. And this is from the first part we just read, where Jesus talks about murder. Um, and obviously it makes sense that uh, if you murder somebody, there's consequences for that, right? Makes sense. Jesus equates that with anger which we've been talking about. If you've been following along with the podcast last couple of weeks, we've been concentrating on anger. And that's pretty shocking, really, isn't it? To equate murder with just being angry at someone. But this next part for me is even more shocking. Because a calm demeanor doesn't necessarily mean that our hearts are in the right place towards others. So Jesus addresses a very um, dangerous form of anger, contempt. So we read the part where it says basically not to insult another person. And the word that's translated as idiot or fool there is raka, which actually is a contemptual term. Um, Contempt seeks to diminish the inherent value of another person, race or gender, etc. And basically, I think what it does is it gives us a feeling of superiority when we do that. So it lets out or allows us to treat other people um, as less than human, not even worthy of love or even our anger. They become to us in some ways subhuman, so we exclude them from care or from thought, like we call that today cancel culture, and dignity. And you know, you might say, oh, I would never do that, but it's, it is kind of easy to do. If someone hurts you or hurts someone you love, it's pretty easy for us to kind of write them off and just ignore them for the rest of our lives. That's actually a form of contempt. And if we think about it, I don't know if any of you watch or look at or read social media, but there are people that actually build whole audiences around contempt. Contempt for other people, other political parties, other religions, other... uh, Uh, sexuality, race, economic status, vaccination status, conspiracy theories. In fact, I would say right at this moment in time that our culture is very divided. Does that make sense for everybody? Probably more divided than it's been in a very, very long time. But here Jesus is saying that every person is valuable to God. And if we read through Scripture, we see the reason for that. And that is because they are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. I am believe it or not, and made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. So it's okay to attack ideas. And if they're attacking um, theological ideas, our defense of that would be called apologetics. So that's where we defend our faith based on our um, knowledge and understanding of Scripture. So it's okay to attack ideas, but it's not okay to attack people. We can't say that people are stupid because of what they believe. Then we're getting into that dangerous territory of contempt. And you might say, oh, come on, what's the big deal? No one's really being hurt by this. At least no one's being physically hurt by contempt. But we'll see as we go in and jump into the next chapter, which is also about contempt in the book, that it can actually become very hurtful. So in chapter 20, so we've just read, if everyone is valuable, then no one should be invisible. So we're carrying on this theme of contempt into chapter 20. So what happens when we have such disregard for people, when we have contempt for people, that we ignore them completely? What's the consequence or what happens because of that? So when we're angry, have you ever been angry? Angry enough to really want to hurt someone? Why, if I got them in a back room, boy, I'd... I can see, boy, I can see the people have active imaginations. <laughs> okay, come, come back to me. <laughs> That's anger. We can all relate with that. We're angry. We want to hurt someone. But contempt is not caring whether they are hurt or not. Because it doesn't matter. We just don't care about them anymore. But, as Dallas Willis in his book Divine Conspiracy explains, um, he explains why contempt is 
um, worse than just ordinary anger. He says, In anger, I want to hurt you. In contempt, I don't care whether you're hurt or not, or at least I say so. You're not worthy of consideration one way or the other. We can be angry at someone without denying their worth. But contempt makes it easier for us to hurt them or see them further degraded. So let's take this to the most extreme example we can think of in modern history. Germany during World War II. When the Nazis came to power, they actually convinced people that Jew, Jews or Jewish people were subhuman. Not that they acted subhuman, but they were actually not human. So once contempt, and that's a contemptual thing, that I'm feeling superior over this other race. So once contempt took hold um, and Jews were seen as less than human, any behavior towards them became acceptable, even mass murder or genocide. How can we just, it just blows my mind. How does this happen? And some of you might say, well, if I was there at that time, I would never allow that to happen. But seemingly good people, God fearing people, committed horrifying acts of atrocity because they viewed their victims as not human. And how did it start? It started with contempt. So this plays out even today. One being can cancel culture. People are ostracized by culture for the things they may have done or said. Then it takes a kind of a form of retribution against them that seeks to prevent that person from ever speaking again about anything. And in some cases, deliberately seeks to destroy that person, their career, their way to make money, their um, even an attempt sometimes to write them out of history that they never even existed. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. People need to experience the consequences of their actions, and others need to be able to seek justice without shame. Those are things we've already discussed. But as followers of Jesus, we must not allow contempt and indifference to prevent us from considering every person to be made in the image of God and therefore redeemable. I was reminded of a story in the book Everybody Always by Bob Goff. And I don't know if you've read this book or know who Bob Goff is, but he's a, a lawyer who's a follower of Jesus. And he was invited by the Ugandan government to come and become sort of the legal consul of Uganda, I think was his title. And he was given that position so that he could help um, correct some of the problems in, within the country because there was such corruption, people were getting away with things, including child trafficking. And so... Bob Goff, in one instance, uh, there was a child that was attacked and mutilated, and he did not die. And this became a, a chance for um, Bob to prosecute a witch doctor that had performed this act against this young boy, because now they had a living w witness. And so the, it went to trial, and um, even though there was still a lot of corruption in the country, the the main justice or judge actually was um, attacked by several witch doctors to the point where he had to surround his house with armed guards. But in the end, justice did prevail and this man went to jail for life. And they put him on death row, so he was supposed to be executed eventually. Now again, in this country, it took, like ours sometimes, it takes many years for this to actually happen. And there's lots of processes you can go through to appeal and all that kind of stuff. And Bob was quite overjoyed that this victory had taken place and that this boy saw justice happen. He was able to face his accuser face to face, tell the story that happened to him, and see him be punished for what had happened to him. And Bob was actually able to bring him back to America and have, um, he was able to have surgery to correct um, 
some of the mutilations that were done to him. So you think this is, this is a great story, isn't it? It's a story of justice. It's a story of things that happened, and we're glad to see them happen. But then Bob tells this amazing story about how he was challenged in his spirit. The Holy Spirit challenged him to love his enemy. And his enemy in this case is this witch doctor named, if I'm pronouncing it right, Kabi, K-A-B-I, in prison. And at first he says, no way, this guy's getting what he deserves. And I'm, I don't know much about Ugandan prisons, but Bob says they're pretty bad places. So um, he had that nagging feeling that it wouldn't go away, and he went to visit this guy. And he said he didn't want to. And it was very difficult for him to face this man. I mean, think of the other side, too. This guy had gotten away with an awful lot of stuff. He finally gets what's coming to him. He's in prison. And now the guy who put him there wants to see him. So you can imagine how that may not have he may not really have wanted to see Bob either. <laughs> but he did. He came to, to see Bob. I guess at that point when you're in that kind of prison, you're willing to see anybody just to see somebody. And they started to talk. And they talked about their families, about what was important to them, and they shared stories. And then Bob asked what he can do for the man. still trying to get my head around that. And the man says, I need forgiveness. And Bob in the book says he's kind of flabbergasted at this point. Forgiveness? You don't deserve, it's in his mind, you don't deserve forgiveness. And yet he's reminded of who? The thief on the cross. And so he tells him about Jesus. And the man decides to become a follower of Jesus. And we were talking, Jay was talking about hope before. This is a very hopeless situation. And the man does. And Bob goes back to visit him several more times. And they lead other inmates to Jesus. Now, I don't know, it doesn't say whatever happened to this man, whether he's still in prison or whether he died or whether he was finally executed. But the man himself said he came, he said he admitted he deserved to be there for what he did. And he was willing to go through with whatever punishment was appropriate, but he found hope in Jesus and forgiveness. The end of that statement, Jesus said, unless we are willing to do this for people, then we ourselves are not suitable for the kingdom of heaven. No one is unworthy of God's attention or grace. Absolutely no one, no matter what they have done or said. So who in your life have you written off or canceled? I ask myself the same question. I have to ask God to help me change my heart towards those people. And I think sometimes for us it means just doing the smallest act, choosing to speak to them instead of ignoring them, showing kindness or maybe even generosity. It's scary to even think about it. But maybe that's what Jesus requires of us. Now we're going to move on to chapter uh, 21 and that Jesus, he just, this just doesn't get any easier as we go. More challenge. If Jesus was serious, then we will need more than rules to become godly. So here Jesus starts to contrast the Old Testament or the Old Covenant with the New Testament or the new his new covenant that he's bringing in. And so the point of this chapter is that uh, the law in the Old Testament, remember that uh, 
Moses came down the mountain with the stone tablets called the, the Ten Commandments. Aaron, Aaron went to Bible school. <laughs> it's okay. I, I need someone to help me out. In addition to that, if you read the books of Leviticus, um, there are 613 rules that were that came along with that that act as, acted as guardrails for the nation of Israel. Now we're using a, a car metaphor here, a driving metaphor, and we can see the law acts like the guardrails. So in this case, we have a very unrighteous nation. They're not very good drivers, and the guardrails, every time they bump into the guardrail, it tells them to get back into the middle of the road. Does that, make, does that kind of make sense for everybody, the metaphor we're talking about here? Okay. Now Jesus comes along and he gives a new covenant. His new covenant is founded on one, just one single command, love one another as I have loved you. And love comes from a changed heart. There's no guardrails needed because we can learn to be righteous that starts from within us and comes to the outside. And this, we've talked with this abiding in Christ and a heart transformation. So we actually get to the point where we actually desire or want to be righteous. Now, I don't think any of us ever achieves that perfection here in this life. I wish we did. But we can still see improvement. Because it doesn't mean we can just do whatever we want in either case, right? If you're just looking at the driver, you might see the guy on the left bumping into the guardrails a little bit, but generally he stays on the road. And the other guy who's a good driver, like they stay on, on the road as well. So if you're looking from the outside in at any given moment, they might look the same. But there is a big difference. So let's take an example. In the Old uh, Testament, we have the Ten Commandments, and one of them is do not commit adultery. And of course, this created stability for the environment, for the, the Jewish people while they were traveling from uh, Egypt to the Promised Land. And once they were, uh, got into the Promised Land, and that condition created for stable families and for growth in population, and they became a very powerful nation. At one point, they became the most powerful nation in that area, and so their nation thrived in a very, very violent time. Where at any given spring, when the men went to war, I think as the Bible describes it, um, there was always a threat of somebody who was trying to take your place. And it worked. It seemed to work for the Jews as long as they followed the rules. But if you read the stories in Numbers and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we see that. Over and over and over again, they broke through the guardrails and crashed and burned. Now, Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, has this sort of pattern that we're exploring today. And uh, we've seen it even in, in uh, what, the things we've already read and talked about. So Jesus starts off by re reminding the people what the law is. What is the guardrail? What's the... What's the, the the rule, the, guard, the rule to keep, or the guardrail. But then Jesus says these words, but I say, so Jesus raises the expectation from here to here. And I remember uh, this became really clear to me when I was listening to a message by Andy Stanley, and he says he framed it this way. So the new covenant is simpler, love one another, it's not really easier when you think it through. So Jesus says, reminds them of the law. Do not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who looks at someone with lustful intent has already committed adultery in their hearts. But they haven't done anything. But let's think it through. What does love require? So as long as you don't have sex with anybody who's not your spouse, then they've kept within the guardrails. They've followed the rules. 
But obeying rules doesn't necessarily mean you have a good and loving marriage. You might be addicted to pornography. You might be having emotional affairs. You might undress every good-looking woman in your mind as they walk by. In that case, the person is not a good driver, but they're staying within the guardrails. But truly loving someone and showing them honor and respect leads to a good marriage. You learn to become a good driver. You don't need the guardrails because you love that person and you treat them appropriately and in a loving way. Both may appear the same on the outside, but which one is better? Which one is harder? So, I guess a question we could ask ourselves, are we focused on following the rules? Staying within the guardrails, hoping to avoid a crash? Or, have we seen the exhausting limitations of trying to follow the rules, staying within the guardrails, and committed ourselves to having a transformed heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and learning to be better drivers. Let's take one more example. It's Christmas time, coming into the Christmas season. How many people have a Christmas tree up already? Most of us. How many people have their Christmas shopping all done? <laughs> Blair put his hand up, but I don't think Debbie agrees. Anyway, um, <laughs> so let's take uh, the Christmas season is typically a season where we are often more generous at Christmas time than in other times of the year, and it's usually in a random way. I walk by the um, Salvation Army post. No Santa Claus anymore. No candy canes. Man, but they have this cool little thing where you can use your phone and they've got a $10, $20, and $30 or $50 tap thing that makes it super easy to give. So I wanted to tr try it out, so I did. Um, I generally support the Salvation Army at Christmas time. That's kind of a random thing. I'm walking through the market and there it was. And I know I usually do that, so I, I do. But um, in Luke's version of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, often referred to as the Sermon on the Plain, so likely the same sermon, but in a different place and time, Jesus says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So notice the order in which Jesus says to do things. Give first, and then you will receive. And how much we give determines how much we get back. But we always get back more than what we give. Interesting. So let's compare that to the old covenant, the law, where the Israelites were told to give a portion. Um, we often call this, or we often say 10%. Uh, 10 percent um, was given back to God, but another 10% was actually given to the temple, so we don't want to argue whether it's 10 or 20%, but we'll just say 10% because that's what we're used to. Uh, from what they received, so they received from God first, and then a fixed portion when it was given back to God. It's what we commonly call tithing. So in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is just lambasting the... Uh, the leaders of the religion, the land basin, that's a funny word, isn't it? It means uh, to harshly criticize. So he's criticizing, harshly criticizing the Pharisees publicly for following the rules with great strictness when it comes to tithing, but missing the point of having a changed heart. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying that we can diligently tithe, or 10%, and 
and still not be generous. We don't use our time and our resources to fight for justice, show compassion, and even support our, your local church. And for, I'm just going to be honest here. This is an area where I struggle personally. I'm a, on the uh, disc profile, I'm a red. And I like to be in control of literally everything. <laughs> I'm constantly challenged by my staff and my wife and my kids, anybody else who knows me. <laughs> in this area, because I, I like to be in control. I, want, I like to decide how much for myself. <clears throat> mm, I guess that's kind of what original sin was, wasn't it? Anyway, another topic. So my experience growing up is that I followed the rules. I gave, in the area of finances, I gave my 10%. And uh, when I left home, I... I tried to give the appearance of following the rules, but I didn't really. So when the plate went by, I put something in, but certainly wasn't 10%. And then after living with the consequences of not following the rules, breaking through the guardrails, I found myself having to live with the consequences of that, and for me it ended up being a lot of debt. Later on in life, I decided to follow Jesus and his way, and that started again with me just following the rules, and things got better. I wasn't going into more debt. I was kind of chipping away at the debt. But it wasn't until I completely surrendered my control over my finances to Jesus and asked him to transform my heart to help me be more generous that one, I, first thing, my heart did start to be transformed. I learned to be more generous, and I'm nearly out of debt, and I'm thankful for that. Now, we've talked about money now and again. Uh, there was a series in 2019 called Tip the Scales, and one in 2016 called Treasure Hunter, 16. This is about time to talk about money again. <laughs> you ready, Jay? <laughs> Jay just loves to preach about money and finances. No, I'm teasing. So if you remember at the end of the 2019 series, I issued a challenge for everybody in the area of generosity. I said that um, I asked everybody who was following the rules of giving 10% to maybe think about giving more, adding 1% per year or I think at the time, just one more percent, to just spark generosity. Now, I, I'm the kind of person that I would never ask you to do something that I wasn't willing to do. And I'm not trying to pat myself in the back, but since that time, I've tried to give one more percent every year. I'm not trying to get more money for church operations. I try and give along the lines that Jesus said. Justice, I support International Justice Mission. I'm, mission. I'm a freedom partner. In the area of mercy, our family sponsors a child, and we give to Charity Water. That's a mercy a kind of thing that I'm very passionate about. And faith. We donate to the Bible Project and Wycliffe and our church. So, I'm trying to learn the limitations of just following the rules and allowing my heart to be transformed to become a better driver so I don't need the guardrails. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus' teachings work. They work for me. If you'd like to talk more about that, I'm happy to talk about it. But I was reading this week about learning, and one of the best ways to learn something is to actually do it. So what's holding you back from fully following Jesus? What areas do you need to surrender in? Might not be your finances, might be your kids, might be your spouse, might be your job, might be something else I can't think of at the moment. But we all have it. 
They all have something that we're holding on to, mostly. What do we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us surrender? Try doing it Jesus' way and learn to be a better driver. Mata's going to come now. We're going to share a time of communion. It seems like hope is a word that we've been talking about today, along with so many challenging things from Jesus. And uh, I want to echo what Jay said in the beginning as well about how hope is not just optimism and not just pulling our socks up. And I was thinking about that this week and sometimes when you hear all the things that are going on and you know everything that your friends are going through and people in our church, it's, it's hard to think of how that we can have hope this December and how we can believe that God can bring good out of our difficulties. And it took me back to another December when Ron and I first moved to Calgary, and that's a long, long time ago now when we were young and just had a couple of kids. And that December was a really difficult one, our first one here, because it hadn't been very many months since we had moved with a lot of high hopes and dreams and thoughts for a really great future for our family. It had been just like eight months before that uh, we had moved here because Ron had gotten a really promising new job and we had a new home and we'd never had that before. And we had two little kids, one in kindergarten and one who was just a toddler and then one who was going to be arriving the next spring. But this December was, was uh, oh, such a, such a down time, such a hard time because um, in September, Ron had lost his job, and we had gone through pretty much all of our savings, and we just didn't really know what we were going to do, and we were pretty young, and we had counted a lot on the faith of our parents and hadn't really learned about how to trust God for ourselves. And so um, when I think about looking back at that situation that I couldn't see any good in at the time, the good things that God brought out of that for us was to help us to learn to trust him and to help us to learn what it meant to follow him ourselves. And that certainly took some time because we had a lot more things that we went through and it took some time before he got a job the next year and um, we had a lot of taxes to pay back and I remember that was so, so hard. And, uh, and yet God helped us, and he helped us to be able to find some friends and community so that we weren't doing life by ourselves. And he helped us to learn to lean on him. And that was a good thing that he brought and brought hope to us through that really hard time. So I just want to encourage you today, before we um, gather around the tables together and share communion. I just want to read this verse that Paul talks about in Romans 15. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you'll overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I read this week from Holly Girth that there's nothing that God's love can't redeem. And so when we come through these challenging situations, um, it's not just hope that we have, but God's so generous, he always gives us hope so that in turn we can share it with somebody else and we can encourage them about the things we've been through where we've seen God come through for us. So when you gather together, um, will you share, first of all, share a short story of a time where you saw God help you, where he came through for you, and then 
Secondly, will you share a situation or something that you're going through right now where you need others to encourage you to have hope that God can bring good out of it? So let's just gather around and just move together a little bit um, at tables so that we can encourage each other and share the juice and the bread together. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today. I'm sorry I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> um, there will be plenty of time for you guys to, to stay, and I encourage you guys to finish conversation. A couple of quick announcements before we head out. Uh, if there's anything today that Ron or Myla or anybody said that you'd love to just continue the conversation, please feel free to text NEXT to 587-611-20 and one of us will get back to you. Or you can just talk to us after the service if you prefer in person. We are also doing a Christmas Eve service. Um, so we want to have special treats for you guys and, and just plan our service. So if you are planning on coming, please RSVP. Um, I believe there's a link on the website. Perfect. Yeah, link on the website. Um, let us know. And we would love to have some special yummy treats uh, for that night and see you guys and celebrate Christmas. Uh, if you are interested in giving in person today, I will be at the back donations table and uh, I can take debit and credit. Um, and there's also ways on the app and on our website to give as well if you'd like to do that. So thank you everybody so much for coming today and hopefully see you in two weeks on the 19th.